and he'd balance plates and glasses on the man's back. So if the man even moved, he would be able to hear the plate fall and he would threaten the man. Any of these plates or glasses fall, I'm going to- Guys, this story is about a menace to society. This man terrorized the West Coast for years and nobody knew who was doing it. Just like every other horrible man, they start small. He started by breaking into people's houses and stealing things, just little trinkets, nothing crazy. He just liked to break in, grab stuff and move it around. But just like all of these other guys, it starts to escalate day by day and he eventually started mutilating and torturing animals. And that's a clear sign of a psychopath on your hands. He did this for years and years, just small burglary after small burglary, taking out innocent animals one after the other, just developing this horrible pattern of abuse and intrusiveness. And by the time he hit adulthood, crime spree really started. He kept up this habit of breaking into houses and stealing little things, but he started to escalate that too. And he started stealing money, not large amounts, but pocket cash. He wasn't just taking coins, he started actually taking real funds. It was almost like he was practicing. Like he just wanted to get the reps in, breaking into houses, sneaking around, stealing small things, and going unnoticed to eventually fuel his future crimes, his real fantasies that he wanted to commit. And the crimes that he had in mind were gruesome, and I'll get to them. But this early stage of his break-ins, it just prepped him to be the best criminal that he possibly could. And even though he wasn't stealing large sums of money from the people that he was breaking to originally, he was wreaking havoc on these people's homes. He would go through drawer after drawer and just throw stuff all over the house. He'd break all of their items and steal the women's lingerie, and just leave these people feeling so vulnerable and violated. He would even sometimes move furniture around just to freak them out. And then he would even go and steal all of the weapons that they had in their house for protection to make them feel even more vulnerable than before. So he wouldn't steal anything crazy. He wouldn't do anything to them. He would just move stuff around and take away all of their defenses and make them feel way more defenseless than they did before this break-in. And he started to get more and more crafty the more reps that he got. He always had multiple exit points. Whenever he would enter the house, he would know all of the windows and doors that he could leave and flee from if anybody noticed him. He would even go to the point that he would remove the screen window, so if he had to hop out a window, there wasn't even a screen there. He could get away so fast. And he was just so prepared. He would always wear gloves to never leave fingerprints behind. And mind you, this didn't happen in 2020. This happened in the 1970s, so not everybody knew about the fingerprint stuff. So him going to the extent of removing screen windows and wearing these gloves so he wouldn't leave any prints, he was ahead of his time. He would even go to the extent of setting little alarms for himself just in case anybody came to the house or noticed he was there. He would take their dishes and glasses and put them in front of doors, so if anybody opened the door, he would hear it knock over or break. He would know that they were there and he would leave through the nearest exit point. He was extremely crafty when it came to his burglary. And over the course of 20 months, he committed 120 burglaries. That's how good he was. He would do it over and over and over again, and he would never get caught because of the precautions that he would take before he entered the house. But after 120 successful burglaries, he must have gotten bored. He wanted to take it up a notch. So on September 11th, 1975, he took it up a notch. He broke into a home at about 2 a.m. and he found a teenage girl sleeping in her bed. She thought she was safe at her house and protected. But for some reason, instead of just moving furniture around or stealing trinkets and money, he decided to kidnap this girl. He woke her up in the middle of the night by shining a flashlight in her face and told her that if she doesn't come with him right now, he's gonna hurt her. Usually his crimes were so calculated, but it seemed like something got the best of him and he acted out of the ordinary that got him into a little bit of trouble. Because maybe he didn't notice that the dad was sleeping in the room right next door, or he just got so confident that he was ready to branch out and he didn't even care that the dad was there. But the dad heard him. He heard noises from the other room. And the dad woke up and he immediately went to his back door and he noticed that it was wide open. And when he stepped outside, he saw a man dragging his daughter out of their house down the driveway. This man saw another man with a ski mask dragging his daughter out of his house. And obviously he goes to attack the man to go save his daughter. But unfortunately the burglar had a gun and shot him twice and the man succumbed to his injuries. But this wasn't in his plan. He didn't want to kill the dad. He just wanted to kidnap the girl. And when he shot the dad, he started to freak out. He wasn't used to this. He was used to everything going perfectly as planned. So he let the girl go and flee. So he drops the girl, kicks her in the face, and gets on a bike and rides away. Obviously the cops were called because there was a break-in, an attempted kidnapping, and a man passed away. 
and they said that he fleed on a bike, so they eventually tracked down the bike that he eventually ditched, but there was no sign of him anywhere, and they didn't catch him. The police department didn't have any leads, so they immediately put a $4,000 bounty on his head, which was a very large sum of money at the time. They were aware of the spree of break-ins, but now he had escalated it to murder, so they were like $4,000 for anybody with any details. They needed to catch this man that was terrorizing people's homes because now this burglar was actually a murderer on the loose. He knew the cops were on the lookout for him, but he just couldn't help it. He had to do one more. So he went a few blocks away from his usual area that he would commit these crimes, thinking that he would avoid any run-ins with cops that were patrolling. But he chose a house that cops were actually staking out. And the police officer that was on duty heard something in the backyard as he entered that backyard. So the cop went back there to go see what was going on. And the cop saw him, a man in a ski mask, just like the description from the crime previously. The cop attempted to arrest him, but he was giving him a hard time. And the cop knew that this is probably the same guy that just committed murder, so he fired some warning shots. But this guy played possum. He removed his ski mask to show this cop what his face looked like to try to say that, hey, I'm surrendering. But as he was surrendering, Quick drew his gun and shot at the cop's face. And it nicked the cop's flashlight and hit the cop in the face. And this gave him the opportunity to flee. But he had to flee on foot this time. And there was tracks and they tried to track him, but they just couldn't find him. And he actually managed to get away again. And after this run-in, he finally moved because he knew they were onto him. At this point, he'd built up quite the reputation. He was known as the Facilio Ransacker. But since he moved, he went to a different area. And obviously, he's not slowing down. And he was renamed in that area as the East Area Assaulter. It wasn't actually the East Area Assaulter. The Assaulter was a different word, but I can't say that here. Just know the last word rhymes with grape, if you want to look it up. And he continued his spree of break-ins in this new area. He wasn't slowing down at all. And just like before, he was just taking little things, just little small amounts of cash, and just little trinkets. He wasn't taking anything of much value. It was almost like he was taking souvenirs from the places that he was breaking into. But it seemed at this point, he felt like he got enough reps in that he was able to step up his crimes, to fulfill a different fantasy. And now instead of just breaking in and taking stuff, he was breaking in and sexually assaulting the women that were in the home. He would go around the area and stalk middle-class women that lived alone. Very specifically, he wanted women that lived in a home by themselves. And he preferred women that didn't live in large houses so it was easy for him to escape. Like if he heard something, there was a window right there or a door right there that he would be able to escape immediately. He would stay outside of these women's homes and memorize their routines. He wasn't just doing it randomly. He wanted to know what you did on a daily basis. He wanted to know your patterns, your routines, your habits before he made his move. He did his research and he started to get even more sadistic with it. He would start calling the women before he even did anything. He'd start harassing them over the phone, letting them know that he was stalking them, that he was gonna get them, that he was gonna enter their home. He felt invincible at this point. He knew that these were vulnerable people that lived in a house with no protection. And since he was so good at burglarizing homes, he would prep the house for the day that he would choose to assault these women. He would go into their house weeks prior and steal their weapons like he was doing before, taking away all of their lines of defense. He'd unlock all the windows, take out screens that he specifically wanted to exit through. He would make the house perfect for the day that he actually decided to go in and do what he wanted to do. He'd also stash his own equipment inside of their house. He'd put ropes and tools and things of that nature so he didn't have to carry them in. He would set up the home so he could execute the, the perfect burglary and sexual assault on these women. Their houses were a tool used against them. He wanted to make sure that his crimes were executed to perfection so he felt like he was in full control of the situation. And when he finally felt prepared, when he finally felt like the house was the perfect tool for him to use, he'd finally enter the house one night and he'd sneak in and he'd go to the women's bedside while they were asleep and he'd wake them up threatening them with a gun to their face. He would go on to tie his victims up with shoelaces and then he'd blindfold them and gag them. He started off with just single women, but he eventually matured to doing this to women with kids in the house, but he didn't care. The kids were no threat to him. He knew it was no issue if there was kids in the house. He just wouldn't do it to women that had a man in the house, that were married or had a significant other. He wanted full control. He knew he had full control over a woman that was tied up and her helpless kids, especially when the windows were prepped for him and he had his tools all over the house. And he just kept doing this repeatedly. He was getting away with it over and over again because he was so meticulous with the setup. But eventually the cops got word of this. And when the cops get word of it, they have to give the media some answers because the public is freaking out about the whole situation. So the media goes and publicly says that he's only targeting single women, which was a huge mistake because he took that personally. He took that as a challenge. So then he started going after couples. In his head, he's like, oh, you guys think 
I'm too scared to go after a couple. You think I'm scared of men? Check this out. I could do that too. That was easy. I was just prepping for this. Then he started going after couples. He would do the same thing. He'd stalk their house. He'd set up the house perfectly for himself, rig windows, do all of that. And then he'd wake them both up with a gun to their face. And he would make the woman tie up the man. So the man was completely bound by his partner while he's holding a gun at both of them. Then he would make the husband lay on his stomach completely pig tied and he'd balance plates and glasses on the man's back so if the man even moved he would be able to hear the plate fall and he would threaten the man any of these plates or glasses fall i'm going to kill your wife so the man is forced to just stay there and this man would be stuck on his stomach on his own living room floor with plates and glasses on his back hearing his wife being assaulted in the other room just laying there helpless and when he was finished he wouldn't even let them know he was leaving he wouldn't say anything he would just sneak out his exit point and leave disappear into the night and they would have no idea that he left so the woman who just got assaulted is too scared to even get up out of fear of repercussions from her assaulter and the husband is scared to say anything to yell to move if a plate falls so they just would lay in their house for hours and hours not knowing that he left just stewing in this traumatic assault that he just committed and he just wouldn't even tell him he left and he'd be hours away before any cops were alerted and just like before he would never bring a car he would always be on foot or on bicycle because he knew that would be an easy way to track him but nobody tracks a stolen bike. He just brings a bike to the place, rides it a couple miles away, ditches the bike and walks away on foot. So he was able to get away with it over and over again. He covered all of his tracks. And after he committed several of these attacks in the same community, the city hall had to have a big meeting and bring all of these outraged families into the city hall meeting for either clues or game plans. The city just needed to come together and talk about these horrible things that were happening. Everybody was so outraged and scared and people were standing up and demanding things from the police and the city in general. But guess who else was at that meeting? This man went to that city hall meeting. So he's there watching people talk about it. And just like before, how the media said he was too scared to go after people with husbands, he took the things that they were saying in that city hall meeting as a challenge. And one man at the city hall meeting stood up and said, if he comes to my house, I'm going to take him out. I'm going to shoot him. And this East Area assaulter is sitting in that room looking at this guy proclaiming that he will shoot him if he tries to do anything to him. And he took it as a challenge. That's his next victim. And within that month, he went to that man's house and did exactly what he was doing to everybody else. He tied him up, put plates on his back, and assaulted his wife and got away with it. He was getting so confident at this point. He was getting so good at it that, that he wasn't even excited about it anymore. He had to start calling the police station. This is the East Area Assaulter. And he would tell them he was stalking his next victim. And he would tell them the date it was happening. But they don't know who it is. He would just say, I already know who it is. And just egg on the police, letting them know that they cannot catch him. He was so confident. It seems like he got so bored of being so good at it. He needed to raise the stakes. He needed the cops to be even more on edge for him to get that thrill. And he carried out 23 assaults like this between June 1976 and May 1977. 23. And a handful of those happened right after the phone call. But he was always a couple steps ahead of them. He knew that he just raised the stakes, so he had to start spreading out a little bit. So he's committing these crimes in different areas of Sacramento at this point. He's spreading out so the cops can't track him down. And he even got to the point where he started writing poems for the police station and sending them in. Just cryptic, weird poems. Just to raise his excitement even more. One of the poems was entitled, Excitement's Crave. So you know that he's writing it, letting them know that he's enjoying this process. And up until this point, he was only breaking in and assaulting women. He hadn't started killing it. He accidentally killed that dad that one day. But he hadn't really elevated to being a murderer yet. Until one day, he had a scuffle with this couple that was walking their dog. Nobody really knows the details of it because he took them both out. We just know that he killed both of those people and that seemed to set something else off in him and he started elevating his crimes even further. He had committed so many crimes in this area that he was getting ready to move again. Just in case the cops had closed in on him whatsoever, he was ready to jump ship, move to a different area and start over. But he actually got caught committing a crime right before he moved. But it wasn't a burglary. He was just shoplifting. He tried to steal a hammer and some type of pet repellent, but he only got six months of probation for this because nobody knew who he was. He was just shoplift. So after the six month probation, he was able to freely move to Southern California. So he moved all the way from Sacramento, Northern California to Southern California, so far away from where he committed these previous crimes. And he committed his last stretch of crimes in the Santa Barbara, Orange County area in Southern California. And in this area, they named him the original Night Stalker. This man has three names at this point, because remember, it's 1970s. 
So these police departments aren't communicating. Nobody expects them to be traveling all the way around this massive state just to continue doing a crime spree. They have no idea that these crimes are correlated. But again, he took it up a notch. He wasn't just assaulting people. He wasn't just breaking in. In Southern California, he came to murder and he'd do his whole process. He got so good at it. He would do his whole process of prepping the house, calling the family, letting them know something was gonna happen, hiding stuff in their house, breaking in, tying up the husband, assaulting the wife, but now he was killing them and he was doing the same thing, hopping out a window, pedaling away on a bike, getting away with it scot-free. And this new police department, it's a brand new case. They have no information on him. They have no idea he's been doing this. So it's not like there's already a case flowing on him. He's hundreds of miles away from his last crime. So they're starting fresh with this new criminal who is so precise with his crimes. They didn't stand a chance, but eventually the police department started talking because they found a diamond knot on their victims. And nobody noticed this for a while, but he was using this very specific diamond knot when he was tying people up. And when he was the East Area Assaulter, he was doing the same thing. So they started talking. They're like, we think we have the same guy on our hands. This is a very specific, complicated knot. We think this is the same guy. So instead of being the East Area Assaulter or the original Night Stalker, now he elevated again to the Diamond Knot Killer. This man has three nicknames at this point. Wait, actually four, I miscounted. He has four nicknames at this point. And he continued his horrible crime spree until his last crime. His final attack was on May 4th, 1986. He entered a home where he had stalked a teenage girl and waited until her parents went on vacation. He broke into the house, bludgeoned her and assaulted her, and he left on foot, just like he had been doing for the last 10 years, and he never did it again. His crime spree lasted for 13 years, but he stopped when he was 41 years old. And at this point, DNA started to come into play in the police departments, and they connected DNA from the East Area Assaulter to the Diamond Knot Killer. And this was the official link between these two people. Now they were sure that this was the same guy. It became a nationwide phenomenon and people started being obsessed with this because he got away. And if he had done it in multiple areas, he might be doing it somewhere else. So this one crime writer named Michelle McNamara started to pursue this case because it had went cold and she wrote a book about it called I'll Be Gone in the Dark. And she re-nicknamed him to the Golden State Killer. Five nicknames at this point but nobody found him for years. Nobody was able to track this man down. But that's until 2018, when the DNA scene really came into play and things like Ancestry.com became very real, where these companies are collecting massive pools of DNA from people that just wanna see what percentage of Balkan they are. Yeah, I'm 20% Egyptian, I'm 10% Nigerian, but it actually led to finding this man. Because when you have DNA, at that massive a scale, and you have the DNA from this Golden State Killer, you could narrow down his close relatives. And his DNA matched somebody who had put their DNA into Ancestry.com, and they were able to connect him to the D'Angelo family. He was a close relative to one of the D'Angelos, and they narrowed it down to six family members. And after questioning those six family members, they narrowed it down to two. They narrowed it down to two brothers. And when they went and questioned one brother, he never lived in those areas. There's no way he could have committed these crimes. But the other brother lived in all of those areas. So the only remaining suspect was Joseph D'Angelo. The cops immediately went to go take a swab of his uh, car handle, Joseph's car handle, and it was a perfect match. Joseph D'Angelo was the Golden State Killer, and he was finally arrested in April 2018. His last crime was 1986. He was 72 years old, and when they pulled up to his house, all he said was, it's about time. He didn't even try to deny it. He had gotten away with these crimes 45 years, and by the time he was found, he was a frail old grandpa. And when you look into his past, you get a different perspective on how he was getting away with it and how it even started in general. Early in his life, his father was a military man and he was stationed in Germany. And I guess at some point while they were in Germany, he saw two military men sexually assault his sister, which could potentially be the breaking point that started this horrible mindset that was the seed to all of these future crimes. He was also abused by his father very consistently while he was growing up, which also was a key factor in these. But he acted pretty normal. By the time they moved back to the States, he seemed like a normal teenager, but he was killing animals on the side and breaking into people's houses for fun. Um, after high school, he got his GED and he joined the Navy and he was actually sent to the Vietnam War. And he served 22 months in the most brutal war in American history. Most people don't know, they think it's World War II. 
Vietnam was a bloodbath, and he actually won medals of service and was a very respected man in the military. So when he got out, he very easily got a job as a police officer. He also went to Sacramento State University and got a degree in criminal justice. And once he joined the force, he got an internship working with the burglary section of the police department. So he was getting an inside scoop on how burglars get caught. That's why he was so good at it. He knew everything that they looked for. With what he learned in the military and in the police department, he became an extremely efficient criminal. He learned all of these effective ways to get away with it. He even got engaged to his college girlfriend and she didn't expect anything until they went on a hunting trip together. They were riding bikes and a dog pulled up on them. And instead of fleeing from the dog, he got off the bike and stomped the dog to death. And she immediately got scared of him. She saw red flags right away. And she said that that was kind of the breaking point in their relationship and they eventually didn't get married. He got really upset with that ex-girlfriend, ex fiance named Bonnie. He even tried to threaten her to marry him and, and stay with him, but Bonnie's dad stepped up to him and was like, you better stay away from my daughter. And he actually had to exit Bonnie's life. But Joseph moved on from that and he actually found another woman that he eventually got married to. Her name was Sharon and they got married in 1973 and she never suspected anything. He got away with it right under her nose because he was an active police officer. She probably just thought he was staking things out. He had police work to do. Why would you suspect that your police officer husband is the Golden State Killer? And the way he kept getting away with it was because he had the inside scoop in the police department. So he would know if cops were staking out a specific house that they thought was a target and he would just avoid it. He knew where the forces were staying. He knew where the cops were. He would just be able to weave around it with his inside information. And once he felt like they were getting too close to him because he knew how close they were getting, he would just transfer to a different police department. It was so easy for him to move because he had a good reputation in the police department and could just secure a job somewhere else. So whenever he felt like they were getting too close, he would just pick his family up, move to a different city, and start his crime somewhere else where he still had the inside scoop because he was still a cop. And remember when he got caught stealing? He actually got fired from that police department and he actually threatened the police chief's life, but he just thought it was a disgruntled employee and they didn't look into him. They just thought he stole something, he's not allowed on the force anymore, let's just kick him out. So he just moved. And after his last crime and after he retired from the force, he just lived out his life as a mechanic. He just wasn't committing crimes anymore. He had a family, he had a wife, they had no idea what he did for years. He was just happy with the crimes he committed and he lived a happy life. And when they finally caught him, he wasn't hiding anything, he was willing to talk. He's like, I'm 72, I lived a fulfilling life, I did all the crimes that I wanted to do, what are you guys gonna do to me? I'm gonna pass away soon anyway. Death row, you guys won't even get it done by the time I croak. So he just told them everything and he said, that in that time in his life, there was an alternate personality in his head named Jerry that was making him do everything and that he didn't have control over Jerry at that point in his life. But eventually he gained control over him to stop, but he just blamed it all on Jerry. And once he pushed Jerry out of his life, he was happy with his life. He lived a happy, fulfilling life as a retired police officer, probably on pension, and a nice wage as a mechanic with a beautiful wife and beautiful children. He didn't deserve that. He destroyed hundreds of people's lives. This is one of the worst cases because it's not a bad ending for the criminal. It's a horrifying story of somebody who got away with murders and assaults over the course of a decade across an entire state protected by the police department who just slipped up under everybody's nose and lived a fulfilling life when he shouldn't have. He should have been serving life when he was 40, but they found him at 72 and they sentenced him to 13 consecutive life sentences, which was probably like four more years for his old ass. But that's the story of the Golden State Killer, Joseph D'Angelo. Guys, if you wanna learn how to tell your story just like I tell mine, I need you to go to DougieCarado.com and buy the Content Academy. It's a 250 page ebook that will teach you exactly how to do what I do and make it your living. I want you to learn how to tell your story just like I did. DougieCarado.com Content Academy. It'll be the best decision you ever made. Back to the show. There's nothing better than a sweet old woman or a loving grandfather, but there's nothing scarier than an unhinged old person. I don't know what it is, but when a grandmother starts acting strange, anyone that's seen the movie The Visit would know what I'm talking about. So this story takes place in Sacramento, California in the late 1980s. During that time in Sacramento, there was a major homeless crisis. It was just a mix of a mental health crisis and a homeless crisis all in one, to the point to where the city put together a task force to get the situation under control. The organization was called the Volunteers of America, and their goal was to help individuals get help and get off the streets and fix their mental health issues, or at least get help for their mental health issues. And the story starts with a sweet, loving woman named Judy. Judy was a part of the Volunteers of America, and she would go around helping homeless people and people that were suffering with mental health issues, and she would just try to find them good homes and get them off the streets. 
and she had helped hundreds if not thousands of people up to this point, and she eventually came across a man named Bert. Bert was a middle-aged gentleman that moved here from Costa Rica when he was about 16 years old, and he suffered from schizophrenia. He was diagnosed with schizophrenia when he was 16, and his parents did their best to try to help him. They even eventually put him into a mental institution to try to get some help, but the mental institution didn't really help him that much, because everybody knows at that time in the country, mental health institutions weren't the best institutions in the world. If anything, they were just kind of prisons and experimental treatment centers. And during his time at this specific mental health institute, they tried to treat Bert with what they called shock therapy, and they put him through multiple trials of shock therapy, and it was just absolutely traumatic. And they just kept doing this and mistreating him up into the point where Bert was finally released from this mental health institution. But at that point, he didn't reconnect with his family. He just felt like he was on his own. He didn't like what happened to him at this institute. He didn't like that his parents put him there, and he just kind of did his own thing from there on out. So at this point in Bert's life, he is is schizophrenic, he's homeless, and he eventually made his way to Sacramento, California just because it's warmer weather. Everyone knows that homeless people tend to flock to the west coast or to warmer states because it's just an easier way to live as a homeless person. So he managed to get himself to Sacramento, but he was also still homeless in Sacramento. Bert ended up finding a detox center, even though he wasn't an alcoholic, it was just the only place that he could stay and live and they would actually kind of help him a little bit. And Bert really preferred this detox center over institutions or anything of that nature, and the people that worked at this detox center actually liked Bert and they didn't mind that he stayed there. He kind of just minded his own business. He was a rather simple guy. He didn't cause anybody any harm, he didn't get in the way, he didn't start any problems. He just had schizophrenia and just had a hard time finding work and a hard time taking care of himself. But the people there were nice and just let him stay. But when Judy found Bert, she was very curious as to why Bert wasn't staying at a place that was specifically meant to help people that were mentally ill. And Bert replied with the obvious answer that those types of places don't really treat them well. And he just tried to stay away from them and he would rather be at a detox center than a mental health institution. Even though the people at this detox center liked Bert and they didn't mind him staying there, they did need more room for people that were actually suffering from alcoholism and they were trying to find a new place for him to stay that fit his needs. And Judy was there for him and tried her best to find him another place to stay, but Bert insisted that he would rather stay at a detox center. So she helped, and she went searching the Sacramento area for a new detox center. And while Judy was searching Sacramento, this place was recommended to her by all of her friends, and they had only good things to say about the woman that ran it. The woman that ran it was named Dorothea Puente. She was known for taking great care of her clients and helping people through the process of detoxing and alcoholism. And she was also known for loving her community and just being a sweet older woman. She had a reputation for donating to charities and, and funding political campaigns. She was really hands-on in her community and everybody just had such great things to say about this woman. So Judy was intrigued. She was always so open to taking in new people and just helping them. And her neighbors knew her well. She treated her neighbors great. She would give free food away to her community. She would even give away free food to her community, food that she cooked herself. She would do burrito day and just hand out burritos to her entire community for free. She was just known to be an angel on earth. Everybody loved this woman. And the way her detox center was set up, she just had it at her house. She would live on the top floor and she just had a bunch of rooms that she would rent out to these detox clients. So not only was this woman giving out free food, donating to political campaigns, and donating to charities, she was also giving out her spare rooms to people with mental health issues, people that were detoxing from hard drugs, people that were battling alcoholism. She was just so open and so giving with everything that she had. And the people that she would take in really had no other options. They weren't really in contact with their families. They had no friends. They had no money. They were originally homeless. These people had no support system and Dorothea would take them in and be their support system. And the only thing you had to do to live at Dorothea's house was give her your social security checks every month, which usually are only about $400 to $600 at the time. It was a very, very cheap rent. And you had a place to stay and she would cook you food and, and you would just have everything that you needed in a loving, sweet environment in a particularly nice house. So when somebody would sign up to live there, they would just sign over their right to their social security checks and it would just go straight to Dorothea and she would just cash those checks straight into her bank just to make the process easier for her. Instead of having to ask everybody for their checks every single month, they just went straight to her. And when Judy told Bert that she had found a new place for him to stay, he was pretty excited. He liked the spot he stayed at, but he was open to change. So Judy took Bert to Dorothea's house and immediately Judy was so impressed with the setup and she was so impressed with Dorothea in general. Judy even said that when she showed up, Dorothea had a box of kittens that she was feeding milk and she just seemed like the sweetest old lady. She knew that this was the best place for Bert and she was so happy that she found this home for him. She even described Dorothea as 
somebody that nobody could possibly have anything negative to say about. She was just an angel. And while Judy was there, she actually ran into somebody that she helped previously. His name was John Sharp, and he had been staying at Dorothea's house for months at this point. And obviously she asked John, how is it here? Should I leave Bert here? Is it a good place? And John only had good things to say about Dorothea as well. He just kept saying that it was so nice to have his own room and to have home cooked food that Dorothea would make for all of her tenants. And she talked about how kind she was to everybody. And Judy was so impressed that she had to tell Dorothea how she felt. Judy liked to express her gratitude to people that deserved it. And she actually started asking Dorothy, how is she capable of doing all this? And Dorothea had a very simple response. She said, I'm independently very wealthy and it just warms my heart to home these people and to help people that are in need. And just giving them a place to stay meant so much to her. So Judy was sold and signed Bert up right away. And the process of signing up was very simple. All Bert had to do was sign his social security checks over to Dorothea so she could cash them herself. Because remember, everybody that was living there was mentally disabled or going through a hard detox or battling alcoholism. So it just seemed simple. Nobody batted an eye about Dorothea having full access to their social security checks. The rent was so cheap and so affordable and she was so helpful. It was just a simple transaction. And for the first few weeks, everything seemed to be going great. Bert loved it there. He said everybody there was very friendly. Food was great. He was just really enjoying his stay. And this warmed Judy's heart because she had a soft spot for Bert. He was a simple guy, but he was just very sweet. He was just kind of aimless. He was a middle-aged man that just mentally couldn't take care of himself, but he didn't have a bad bone in his body. He was just a kind-hearted guy that needed help. So she was so happy that she got Bert into a good place. And she liked him so much that she wanted to check up on him constantly just to make sure that he was okay. Even if he was in great hands with Dorothea, she just wanted to stay on top of it and make sure that he was good. So one day, a few months after Bert had moved in, Judy gave Dorothea a call and just asked to see if she could talk to Bert just to check up on him. But Dorothea said that Bert wasn't around at the moment. She said that she sent Bert to Mexico with her brother to celebrate some type of fiesta or something. She just said that there was some sort of party going on and Bert tagged along with her brother and he was out of the country. And even though Judy was fully sold on Dorothea, this lit up some red flags for her because she knew Bert pretty well. She knew Bert probably wouldn't do that. She just knew something wasn't right. And just how dismissive Dorothea was over the phone just trying to get off the phone with her, she just immediately became very suspicious of the entire situation. But Dorothea just told Judy to call back in a few days because he'll be back. But when she did call in a few days, Dorothea said, he's not back yet. She tried to push it off saying he'll probably be back next week, so just give us a call next week. But Judy wasn't having it. She knew Bert wouldn't just go to Mexico with somebody. She knew that he was a creature of habit and really had no intention of traveling anywhere. He just wanted to be comfortable and happy. So she threatened Dorothea. She said, if you don't get Bert on the phone right now, I'm gonna have to call the police. Dorothea got her to calm down a little bit and said, just wait till Monday, he'll definitely be back. You could talk to him then. But Judy made it very clear. If I don't get a call from Bert on Monday, I'm calling the police and I'm filing a missing persons report. And when Monday came around and Judy was ready to call up Dorothea to press her to talk to Bert, Judy actually ended up getting a call beforehand from a man. And this man said that Dorothea had let him know that Bert had left. He had moved out of Dorothea's house. And he said something along the lines of, Bert went home. He doesn't live there. He went home. He went on to explain that his family picked him up. But Judy knew something was very wrong with that statement because Bert had no intention of being in contact with his family and he had no contact with them for years at this point. And it made no sense that somebody came to pick him up. He was completely alone and Judy knew that. So instead of calling Dorothea back, because obviously she's just pushing the date and lying and doing all of these weird manipulative tactics in their conversations, she decides to call the man John Sharp that she's familiar with that lives at Dorothea's house. And when she gets on the phone with John Sharp, John Sharp says that Bert does not live there anymore. He says Bert is gone. So Judy follows up and asks John if he went to Mexico too, if he tagged along with Dorothea's brother and went on this trip to Mexico for a fiesta. And John Sharp had no idea about this trip to Mexico or this fiesta that was going on. He said that nobody here went to Mexico. Everybody's here. Bert is just gone. And at that point, a little bit of fear crept into John's voice. And he let Judy know very subtly that something is wrong here. He said there's something wrong with this place. He doesn't know what it is. But the only thing that he knows is that Dorothea is digging a lot of holes. Because remember, John Sharp is battling some detox and alcoholism. He's not the sharpest tool in the shed. So he's trying to express himself and his concerns to Judy in the best way that he possibly can. And all he could say is, something's wrong here. She's digging a lot of holes. So at this point, Judy starts digging a little bit on Dorothea. She doesn't trust this lady at all. And she's trying to find some information, some background information on Dorothea, whoever this lady is. And she comes to find out that Dorothea Puente 
isn't named Dorothea Puente. She's originally known as Dorothea Gray. She was born in 1929 and her parents died very early and her upbringing was quite difficult and traumatic. And then as Judy kept digging, she started to find Dorothea's criminal record that she didn't initially find because Dorothea said that her name was Dorothea Puente and Dorothea Puente hadn't committed any crimes. Dorothea Gray committed crimes. And when you go look up Dorothea Gray, it's a list of crimes. She found out that Dorothea started her professional career as a sex worker because she didn't really have any other options because she had no other parents. And she had upgraded from a sex worker to a madam. If you don't know what a madam is, it's a sex worker that recruits other sex workers. And in 1960, Dorothea was arrested for the first time. And she was prosecuted for being a sex worker and operating a brothel. But she only served a short sentence for this. When Dorothea was finally released, she knew that she couldn't really operate brothels and live in that world anymore because she was on the police's radar, so she changed it up a little bit. So instead of being an active sex worker, she would just kind of pretend to be a sex worker, go to men's houses, and then drug them. And she wouldn't just drug them, she would drug them and then rob them for everything that they had. And at that same time, she was also impersonating a doctor. She was pretending to be a doctor. And not just a regular doctor at a hospital, because that would be very hard to do. She was trying to pass herself off as a traveling nurse. But she wouldn't go to youthful people's houses because they would probably see right through her act. She would only take clients that were extremely elderly that couldn't really tell if she was a nurse or not. She would just carry a stethoscope in her bag and some drugs, pretend like she was checking what was wrong with them, and then drug them and steal everything that they had. She would steal all of their jewelry and cash and she would write herself checks and she would go to the bank and cash checks from these clients pretending to be a doctor and eventually she got caught for this and she was sentenced to prison for five years. And this little part became known quite a bit later after this entire story ends, but, but Dorothea was actually accused of killing a woman during this process as she was robbing people. She met an elderly woman named Ruth and she convinced Ruth that they were friends and she was gonna take care of her and they were gonna live together. And she even convinced Ruth to go into business with her. She convinced Ruth to open a cafe with her and fund it. But during the process of this cafe being open, she would tell Ruth that it wasn't doing good and she needed more and more and more money until she completely drained Ruth's account. And Ruth was rather wealthy, so it took a little while and they developed a bit of a friendship and they stayed in, her, in this business relationship for quite a bit. But eventually, once Ruth's money ran out, Dorothea had no use for her. But the issue was that Ruth's partner passed away and Ruth's only option was to move in with Dorothea, so she lived with her at this time. And Ruth's kids, whenever they would come to visit their elderly mother, they would say that something was off with their mom. They would always come in and she would always have a drink in her hand. And it was always a drink that Dorothea made for her. But the weirdest part about this was that Ruth was allergic to alcohol. So she shouldn't have even been drinking a drink in the first place. And when the kids would question Dorothea, like, why are you giving her drinks and alcohol and things of that nature? She, Dorothea would explain that she's just trying to calm Ruth's nerves because the business is failing and she just needs to take the edge off. She was convincing her kids that she was just doing the right thing by her friend. And eventually as Ruth's money completely ran out and the business failed and eventually closed, Ruth was absolutely defeated. She was devastated by this entire situation. She felt like she had nothing. And that's why Ruth was willing to take these drinks. She really was going through a lot of stress and she was trying to take the edge off. And after the business closed and Ruth was consistently drinking these cocktails that Dorothy was making for her, her son started visiting her a little bit more often because he was really concerned about his mother who is now poor, living with a borderline stranger. And one day when Ruth's son came to visit, Dorothea was like, she's upstairs. And he was like, I wanna see my mom. And she's like, she's not feeling well, come back another day. But Ruth's son didn't like the whole situation. He didn't like that his mom was living with this stranger and she just got really sick really randomly. And he knew that his mom was going through a really hard time. So he was trying to be there for her. So he wasn't leaving. He was like, no, I wanna see my mom right now. And he said when he went up to the room to go check on her, she was just laying in her bed with her eyes open, not moving. Like she was just in a sedentary state. Like she was almost a living zombie, just laying there lifeless, but alive. Alive. Her son really didn't like this situation and he was planning on changing it, trying to figure out a way to help his mom even though he wasn't very financially stable himself and he just told his mom, don't worry, I'll be here tomorrow, I'm gonna keep checking on you, I'm here for you. But literally the next day when he went to go check on his mom, he came to the house and Dorothea said, she's gone, your mother died last night. And Dorothea let all the kids know that they need to come pick up all of Ruth's stuff from her house in a very cold manner. She made it seem like they were business partners and friends, but once Ruth passed away, she was just like, you guys need to come get her stuff. And even though that was a bit odd, the kids were like, okay, yeah, we're gonna come get our mom's stuff. But when they went to go get her things from Dorothea's house, 
there was almost nothing there. All of the jewelry that she accumulated over the years wasn't there. Dorothea gave them a borderline empty purse and was just like, here's the stuff and get her minor belongings out of my house. And naturally, Ruth's children saw red flags here and they were fully convinced that Dorothea poisoned their mother and stole everything from her. But Ruth's death was ultimately ruled a self-induced death, if you know what I'm saying. But her kids knew that that was not true because when they got the autopsy and they got the blood work back, there was a laundry list of drugs in her system when she passed away. And they knew that her mom didn't take any of these. So they immediately knew that Dorothea was mixing these drinks for her to take the edge off, but she was actually spiking her drinks with all sorts of drugs. But they couldn't do anything about it. There was no proof. And the police just pushed the case aside. They just thought it was an elderly woman that passed away and they just didn't do anything for these kids. So these kids just, what are they supposed to do? They just have to move on with their lives. They still have to provide for themselves. So nothing happened to Dorothea. And after this, since all of Ruth's money ran out and she had no income coming in because the business shut down as well, Dorothea moved on to her new business which was running an in-home care facility. Dorothea was absolutely not licensed to do this, but because she put off this demeanor as being a sweet older woman, nobody batted an eye. They just thought, here's a nice older lady, she's not a dangerous person, and she's just trying to help people. So now we're gonna go back to the case of Bert. After Bert's disappearance, the police started to get involved and they started looking into Dorothea a little bit, especially after John Sharp let Judy know that Dorothea had asked him to cover for her. She was clearly trying to cover her tracks because the police were looking into her. And Dorothea straight up asked John Sharp to lie to the police for her. But John doesn't do that. He snitches on her to Judy, so now the police know. And an investigation starts on Dorothea and the whole thing that she's running. The police show up and they start searching her house and they find all sorts of weird things all over this woman's house. They find little empty blue pill capsules all over the floor, all over the house. And with her criminal background of drugging people, this is a major red flag. And now that there's a missing persons case because Bert is missing, the police are like, all right, we searched all the house. We didn't really find anything in here. Do you mind if we check the backyard? Do you mind if we dig a little bit in the backyard? And Dorothea was just oddly calm. And she just obliges and just says, yeah, I don't mind. There's nothing in the house. You're not going to find anything in the backyard. Go ahead, dig all you want. And she was oddly, oddly calm about this especially when you find out what the police found in her backyard. Within the first few hours of digging, they start finding very odd materials in her yard. It started off with just finding a bunch of cigarette buds and then just like pieces of cloth, but there was a lot of them and other miscellaneous items that were like, why is this in a garden? So they just really start digging because they're finding all of this weird stuff. They're like, we might as well keep going. We keep finding things and they eventually hit something that's very hard. And this cop reaches into the dirt and pulls out a human femur bone. And he realized that the cloth that he was pulling out of the dirt was deteriorated human skin. He thought he was pulling out some type of jerky or cloth material, but it ended up being human skin. And he realized that the femur bone was attached to a full body. So naturally the police go and question Dorothea like, hey, why did we just find a body in your yard? But she just denies it immediately. She says, I have no idea why that's back there. And she starts playing possum. She starts acting very elderly and innocent and sweet. And she just starts acting concerned about the body that was just found in her yard. And she's really putting on a show. And mind you, she looks like a very elderly woman and she plays this act very well. So the police officer is just like, this is very strange. She doesn't seem like she did this. She doesn't look like she's capable of doing this. This femur bone is clearly from a large person. There's no way this elderly woman would be even be capable of doing this herself. So he's not positive that she's the prime suspect at this point. They don't even have enough evidence at this point to put her under arrest or anything of that nature. So eventually after the first day ends, they have to come back the next day to start digging. And Dorothea's there standing on the balcony, just watching them dig all day just watching every move that they're making. And she starts looking a little bit more concerned. And the cop realizes she's looking more concerned the further we go to the left in her yard. So he starts digging a little bit to the left. He starts making another hole, digging in a different area of the yard. But naturally you have to dig pretty far, so it's taking a few hours. And when they take a break, Dorothea comes up to the police officer and just says, hey, like, am I under arrest right now? Can I go get coffee with my nephew down the block? He's staying at a hotel down the block. I just want to see him. Is that okay? I'm not under arrest, right? I could, I could go down the block right now. And the police officer, not being overly skeptical of her at the time, also knowing that she's an elderly woman and she can't really get far. And it is really just at the corner. She's 
she said exactly where she's going. He was like, okay, you go get a cup of coffee. Just make sure you're back within an hour or two. And he went back to digging. But right when he went back to digging, they struck gold again and they hit another bot. And at that point, he knew that she was aware that they were about to find another one and she tricked him and left. So when they went to go search the hotel that she said she was getting coffee with her nephew at and she wasn't there, they immediately put a bolo out for her arrest. They knew it was her and she ran. And this bolo for Dorothea turned into a nationwide manhunt, especially when they kept digging. It got more and more serious the more they excavated her yard because they found seven bodies in this elderly woman's yard. And as they continued to find bodies, they went back into her house to try to find more evidence there because they found bodies, but they don't really have evidence that she did it. So they need to rack up some evidence. So then when they go back into their house and they do a more thorough search, they walked through her living room and they stepped on her carpet and they noticed that the carpet was oddly smushy. So they pick up the carpet and they find a bunch of putrefied liquid stains on her hardwood floors. And they came to the conclusion, this is where she prepped the bodies. So now they had evidence. They eventually found her because she couldn't really get far. There was a nationwide manhunt. They hunted her down and they got her. But this is where it gets really weird. Once they got her in custody, they found out her age and Dorothea was not as old as she made herself seem. If you looked at her, you would think this woman has to be 80 years old. The way she dresses, her haircut, the way she does her makeup and she has wrinkles, the big old lady glasses that she wears, the way she hobbles around, she looks 80 years old, but she was actually the same age as Judy, who was in her early 60s, who was a very active social worker. And Judy was astonished by this. She said that when she met this woman, she was positive she was in her 80s. So Dorothea was hiding under the disguise of being an old woman. So nobody would suspect what she was doing. But realistically, she was a pretty youthful 60 year old. She would just put on a costume and pretend to be an old lady to get away with these murders. Dorothea was not a grandma. She would use this guise to get to convince people to trust her, to leave helpless people at her house so she could drug them, bury them, and collect their social security check for years. Imagine doing that. People always talk about passive income. Dorothea was like, let me just get some homeless people, bury them, and every single one that I do, I get another $400 to $600 on my monthly reoccurring passive income. That was her business model. That's what she was willing to do. She was pretending to be an old, elderly, decrepit lady for years just to convince the public that she was harmless so she could get access to people that had no support and no help and take advantage of them. She was only convicted for three counts of murder, but luckily she was sentenced to life in prison. I don't know why there's something so disturbing about that idea. Just think of a house with an elderly woman in it that seems so sweet and it houses homeless people and mentally ill people and people struggling with alcoholism. But the person that is at the core of it, the pillar of this house is actually an evil 60 year old woman pretending to be 80 years old, murdering the people that she's pretending to help and collecting their social security checks. Absolute nightmare. I hope you guys enjoyed this one. I'm getting better at this style. I'm really enjoying doing these, telling these in story format instead of them sounding like a documentary. I hope you enjoyed it. Let me know who you want me to go over next or any suggestions of the content you would like to see in the future in the comments. We're posting two times a week. If you haven't subscribed yet, subscribe now. I love y'all. I'm out.